This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. First, uh, thank you so much for coming, and uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Ford and everyone here at IHMC who have been so gracious in hosting me here, and it's been a great um, experience so far. I've really enjoyed just seeing the parts of the city I've seen thus far. It's a really charming town. Um, okay, so what it, uh, without further ado, I want to talk about um, something that I, I find very important as we age to be aware of, and that's the role of chronic inflammation <clears throat> and its potential to influence um, health outcomes as we age, and, and then what we can do about it. So what I try to do is organize this talk into uh, a few different sections. Section one is just what is aging in general, which I'm not going to give you the perfect answer, but I'll give you an answer. <laughs> uh, section two would relate to how, how does this uh, phenomenon called oxidative stress and our, our cellular stress relate to chronic low-grade inflammation. Then we'll talk about some of the, many of the causes, uh, focus in on, on lifestyle factors, as Ken mentioned, and then talk about the part that's more exciting and uh, have, has the potential to improve everyone's health, and I hope it will, uh, which is the potential interventions that can avert low-grade inflammation. And then uh, I'll summarize a few uh, r reviews that we've recently completed in the past couple years. And, and again, I hope this information will be directly applicable. <laughs> okay, so we'll start general and we'll, we'll get more specific as we go. Uh, so what is aging? This is not <laughs> the uh, scientific answer, <laughs> but it is a, a true answer, and that is uh, it's a loss of function that occurs over time, uh, physiological, cognitive, physical function. And we know that there's an obvious contribution from genetic factors as well as environmental factors. And then, of course, our lifestyle factors. And these all kind of combine and converge into uh, the phenotype that we call aging. Uh, we know it when we see it. So you <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to ask you which person, w which, which person is younger in this slide, do I? Um, and, and then the question is, what is it that's causing these changes that occur that represent this phenotype? Well, of course, um, the etiology of age-related changes and, and declines in function and skin change, every, every aspect of, of um, health change, it's complex. Um, but there are a number of factors that we have identified that we know do contribute, and, and these are just some of the key ones. There are certainly more, uh, but reductions in blood flow, reductions in cardiovascular function, chronic low-grade inflammation, which we're going to talk about, oxidative stress, what is that, and then metabolic dysfunction, okay? So these are the key themes that we're going to talk through today, okay? Um, so many of you probably have heard about uh, free radicals and the free radical theory of aging, okay? Well, <laughs> um, that was originally proposed by a person named Har Dr. Harmon uh, in 1956, talking about the connection between these free radicals and what we see in terms of rate of aging uh, across different species. And that was expanded um, by Yu and Yang in 1996 to basically encompass um, all reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species. So it wasn't just a certain free radical, but these markers are all contributing to uh, age-associated declines in physiological function. And the, in addition to expanding the contributing factors, this uh, revised theory emphasized the central role of antioxidant defenses uh, as crucial components to this thing called redox balance. Well, what is redox balance? This picture, I think, will tell you much better than what I can describe. So essentially, we all, as virtue of through living, experience um, reactive oxygen species. These are molecules that are generated through metabolic processes, they're generated through exposure to certain environmental toxins, et cetera. Now, when you're young, um, there's a limited amount of reactive oxygen species be being generated, and your ability to scavenge in them is quite high. So you're, you're not under much stress. Your cells are not under much oxidative stress. But as we age, unfortunately, our ability to um, scavenge these reactive oxygen species declines, and at the same time, the production of them 
increases, which is unfortunate, and that can lead to a state of disease. Um, so let's talk about why the production can increase and our ability to handle them can decline. Um, but I first want to make this connection clear that there is this interdependent relationship between oxidative stress, these markers, these free radicals, if you want to think of it that way, and these markers of inflammation, these, these cellular signals that can damage the cells themselves. So we know that oxidative stress, when cells are under oxidative stress, they, that can lead to an increase in expression of pro-inflammatory genes, and that we also know it activates multiple pathways that are related to inflammation, uh, particularly the NF-kappa-B, which is like the master inflammatory pathway. If you activate this signal, then the whole inflammatory cascade can be activated. Okay? And then we also know, vice versa, that by activating the inflammatory process, the cells, that actually leads to an increase in a reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species. So the cells are under a lot of stress. So it's an interdependent process, and they're interrelated. Now, um, for anyone who wants to learn more <laughs> about this, we, um, I had the opportunity to work um, closely with this individual, Dr. Hyung Chung, in 2008 and 2009, who came up with the molecular inflammation hypothesis of the role of chronic inflammation and how it underpins aging and age-related diseases. And so we talk a lot more about this potential connection. Just to show you, uh, this slide I think will tell a, tell a story, though. Um, what, what you see here, and this is again in the paper, is that there's this connection between inflammatory processes and aging processes such that at a cellular level, you can see that the changes that occur in the redox balance, remember the balance between antioxidant and pro-oxidant um, defenses is, uh, well, we have an increased generation of reactive oxygen species, nitrogen species with aging and inflammation, but at the same time, we have a decrease in our endogenous, our, our body's ability to defend itself. We also have an increase in pro-inflammatory enzymes with inflammatory conditions, chronic disease conditions would be an example, but also with aging. Pro-inflammatory cytokines, I mentioned, adhesion molecules, and then this NF-kappa-B activation pathway. They're all upregulated, as you can see, with inflammatory processes and aging processes. So this connection is pretty, pretty tight at the cellular level between inflammation and aging. Now what you see in this third column is something called CR, which stands for calorie restriction, and <laughs> something we all love to do. <laughs> 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 this signal means that it can blunt the effects of many of the negative effects that occur with inflammatory conditions as well as aging processes. Uh, we won't go into this for the moment, the, the fourth column. Okay. Uh, so that's the good news about calorie restriction. We'll talk about potential d downside of it. Okay. Uh, and if I haven't convinced you with the, the slide showing the cellular connection between aging processes and inflammation, I just want to kind of shortly point out, quickly point out, the number of conditions in which inflammation is associated, has been associated. And what do, what do we see here? These are many of the chronic diseases of today um, that um, we all do not want to have, but it's been linked to each of these conditions. The evidence is pretty clear. Okay, so I, I don't want to belabor that point except for just to, to highlight. Um, one of the landmark studies that really showed this importance of inflammation in the blood and why, why it's now become a measure that many doctors take, okay? And this was a study that looked at uh, 15,000 approximately otherwise healthy women and followed them for eight years and divided, up, divided them up into quintiles according to levels of um, C-reactive protein, on the, on the left side, or LDL, which was an already established risk factor. And what you can see is that those with the um, highest levels of C-reactive protein and our LDL had similar, very similar um, risk of mortality and highest, highest rates of mortality. And it progressively decreased as they were, uh, went down the lower levels. So, so that really put, put C-reactive protein on the map to say, hey, we should be measuring this. If, we've already if we're going to say that 
LDL is an established risk factor. This was in 15,000 otherwise healthy women and showing the, that C-reactive protein, a marker of systemic inflammation in the blood, has just as much predictive ability for mortality here over eight years. Okay. Um, additionally, a study that looked at generally healthy individuals 70 years and older um, who did not have a disability, um, they were followed for two and a half years, and looked at then, okay, of the, the individuals who developed a disability, and disability was defined in this study as inability to walk a quarter of a mile, how many of them uh, developed this disability. And what they showed was there was a significant difference in incident disability between those with elevated CRP levels versus those without. In addition, this other marker, IL-6, which is now becoming an established marker of inflammation as well, you see this similar pattern of results in that higher levels were associated with incident disability and lower levels were not over a two and a half year period. So, okay, I, th I think I've probably convinced you that inflammation is not something we want, neither is oxidative stress. Now, what is, what's causing this elevation in oxidative stress and inflammation? Um, and, and particularly with aging, what are, what are some of the factors? Okay, so this slide <laughs> is a broad overview. I'll, I'll take a sip of water and let you look. <laughs> That's great. Um, I don't expect you to remember everything on this slide. I just want to highlight there's a variety of sources that can generate inflammation in the body. There's exogenous sources, uh, it's things like smoking, which we all know is bad for us, air pollution, which we all know is bad for us, alcohol, which at moderate doses may be okay, but at high doses could increase levels of oxidative stress and contribute to inflammation. Infectious burden, um, which is another source of, of exogenous inflammation. Um, and then diet, which we're gonna focus on in a, in a bit. And then endogenous factors, uh, something called adiposity. Does everybody know what I mean by adiposity? <laughs> okay, you got it. <laughs> um, subclinical disease, things like prediabetes or uh, low levels of hypertension can also contribute to the burden. Um, I've mentioned already oxidative stress status um, and then um, how much of immune, res immune response capacity uh, can all be contributing factors that either directly activate this NF-kappa-B pathway, which I mentioned before, or indirectly through a number of different mechanisms that can then lead to um, chronic disease states like the ones we know that are most prevalent today, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, or through a more direct pathway through this uh, uh, NF-kappa-B pathway that can lead to a loss of muscle mass and function, a condition called sarcopenia. Does have you heard of this? No. Okay, okay. Loss of muscle mass and... So sarcopenia is loss of muscle mass and function with age. That's the technical wor definition for it. Um, and then ultimately, with, with either of these physiological consequences occurring, what we can see is um, potential disability or mobility limitations occurring. Okay. Now, I'll focus in a little bit more on the lifestyle factors uh, that I mentioned, uh, particularly, <laughs> I, particularly um, dietary to start, which we know that um, excessive food intake and particularly frequent large portions of high, well, I split high fat, but it may not be necessarily bad fat, uh, uh, high fat in, in the sense of high bad fat meals or high high-calorie meals that are sugar-laden as well can increase production of reactive oxygen in species. And I'll show you an example of this with postprandial glucose levels. Now, what, what the heck is a postprandial glucose level? Uh, <laughs> Post-meal glucose levels and how their rise is strongly related with oxidative stress in the next slide. But before we go there, I want to just make this point because much of this talk is not going to focus on exercise, but we also know that sedentary lifestyle has real potential to increase vulnerability to oxidative stress. And that's because, in large part, without, when you re regularly exercise, 
you enhance your body's ability to defend itself. So these housekeeping enzymes, this endogenous defense is elevated. When you're living a sedentary lifestyle, those same defenses are not as, as good. So that's a one way in which sedentary lifestyle can increase vulnerability to oxidative stress. Um, I think this slide <coughs> tells a story. Um, here, they had participants, the same participants, by the way, eat either a um, fast food meal uh, for breakfast or a American Heart Association meal. And, so, and then they looked at what happened when they ate at McDonald's versus when they had a, a healthy uh, diet, <laughs> dietary meal. And they measured this marker of lipid peroxidine and looked at what happened post-meal. So what do we see? Af after six hours, this marker of oxidative stress and inflammation was dramatically increased in the fast food breakfast meal versus the American Heart Association recommended meal. Now, this is not an advertisement for American Heart Association, but it is just to point out the potential that our foods can have on the burden that our cells experience over many hours. And, and that was eye-opening for me when I saw that study. Okay. Um, so in addition to contributing to the burden from the diet side, frequent unhealthy meals can lead to, to fat deposition. And what we know is that the rates of obesity are, have increased um, over the past few decades across multiple age groups. But in particular, what was also eye-opening for me was that the rate of increase of obesity, what do you see here, is much greater in adults 60 years and older compared to um, younger and middle-aged adults. Um, so if there was a population in which the rates of obesity were increasing more than others, it's this population. Um, so that was also eye-opening. Okay. Now, why is that a concern? Is it, if it was just an aesthetic issue, this would not be as big of an issue. But our, the adipose tissue is an active secretory organ that's secreting um, hormones on the one hand, th so that's disrupting the physiologic mil milieu, but more to the point of this talk, it's actively secreting inflammatory cytokines. So things like IL-6 IL and TNF-alpha, which can then also um, lead to the cells being under oxidative stress, right? So this is actively occurring within the body um, in addition to uh, a, a number of other active agents, such as free fatty acids and steroids. So this tissue is and not just an inert organ, but actively involved in uh, metabolic processes. Now, why is that also important for, for our uh, concept that we mentioned earlier called sarcopenia? Well, with obesity and, and its related conditions, such as diabetes, we know that the, there's an elevation in pro-inflammatory cytokines, and we, we know that those can contribute at the cellular level to things such as apoptosis, which is essentially means cell death, okay? And it can also increase um, cell breakdown, proteolysis, okay? And impair regeneration and protein synthesis at the cellular level. And so over time, if that happens, what can occur is loss of muscle cells, which can contribute to this condition called sarcopenia. So this is why when we start to think about this inflammatory pathway, um, why it's so important to start to see what we may be able to do to stop this from occurring. Um, and, and not surprisingly, what do we see with muscle and aging? We see that there's a decrease in muscle mass due to the loss of muscle fibers, okay? Um, there actually isn't much of a decrease in specific force, uh, but there is a decrease in muscle quality, and that's due to the infiltration of fat into the muscle bundles themselves. So the muscle is not the same as it was uh, when people were younger. There is an increase in fatigability, and then this is something we're going to talk a little bit more about. There's a reduction in, in basal metabolic rate, um, which decreases approximately 4% per decade after the age of 50. 
and that can parallel the loss of lean muscle, okay? So this is why there's this connection between muscle and uh, fat. And in particular, what we can see is that the body composition of somebody can be dramatically different um, when they're 70 years old compared to when they're 25 years old. So this is uh, what can happen due to these uh, m processes that I alluded to, that somebody who was at 20, age 25 had, a, for example, a body fat percentage of 14%. But now, over time, that person's body fat percentage may have increased to 30%, and their lean tissue would have decreased. And so this is just trying to make the point that even if they're not um, considered overweight, their body composition may have changed in a fundamental way that would increase risk of metabolic disease conditions. Okay. Um, I won't harp too much more because I know we're <laughs> talking about things that are not that fun to talk about. But, <laughs> but I just want to point out that that same individual, uh, whether um, they become obese or not, due to those, that body composition in conjunction with an unhealthy diet and physical inactive lifestyle, can lead to a place of autonomic dysfunction, which can lead to a pro-inflammatory state and contribute to these um, changes that can increase risk of cardiovascular disease. Okay. Um, and then those changes can also increase risk of something called the metabolic syndrome. Has anybody heard of this? Okay, most people have. All right. Well, those changes can lead to, uh, when somebody has three of the five of these, uh, or six of these uh, characteristics listed here, they can be determined to have uh, metabolic syndrome. And why does that really matter if somebody is diagnosed with that? Well, first, I want to point out that this condition is increasing what? What do we see? A dramatic increase with age. That, and where does, it, where does it plateau? It plateaus at individuals that are 60 and older. So these individuals have um, almost one out of every two individuals that are 60 and over would have what we call the metabolic syndrome. So that's a concern in the sense of um, the potential that this syndrome has to increase risk of mortality. So when, what do we see here? We see in this study that they, they looked at individuals without the metabolic syndrome compared to the, with the mor uh, metabolic syndrome and looked at mortality risk. And what you can see is there's a dramatic uh, increase in mortality risk for individuals with versus uh, without the metabolic syndrome for both all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality. So why is that happening? In large part, I believe it's happening because what can ha happen over time is when you saturated your body's fat's um, storage capacity w and, and continue when individuals continue to take in uh, unhealthy foods, the fat storage has to go somewhere. And, and the fat can ultimately start to surround your muscle and your vital organs, such as your liver and your heart, and create a state of uh, lipotoxicity, which, was, um, which we m I mentioned earlier that these lipid droplets are not just uh, inert, they're actively secreting inflammatory signals. So this is why, why we, I believe it's such a concern to, uh, to pay attention to. Just to summarize, and then we're going to get to potential interventions. Um, as a summary to the first part of this talk, what I believe happens is that in obese conditions or conditions where individuals have high body fat relative to muscle ratio, they are under an increased uh, state of react, uh, oxidative stress because they are generating more reactive oxygen species, and that can disrupt the, the redox balance which can then lead to, again, increased levels of inflammation and oxidative stress, cause an increase in levels of vascular inflammation, which can contribute to tissue damage and chronic inflammation, and potentially accelerate the rate of aging. Okay, so that's the, the big picture overview. Yay. I know I've probably alarmed you. <laughs> now <laughs> we are going to talk about potential interventions here that may be uh, a effective in reducing some of these negative effects. Okay.
just to give you a big picture overview, one more big picture overview. This is the model that we're following at the University of Florida's um, Institute on Aging, where our ultimate goal is to enhance health and independence and to prevent um, disability. And so we're looking at a number of interventions to do this pharmaceutical, hormonal, surgical, nutraceutical, cognitive training, meditation, non-invasive brain stimulation, and then lifestyle interventions, which is the area that I'm going to focus on. And then you can see here the behavioral factors that we believe can contribute to functional decline. And then here are the, a number of the biological mechanisms that we are targeting. Uh, now, we're, we're conducting a number of clinical trials, and each clinical trial may just target one of these potential mechanisms. So, uh, but it's the whole picture, and, and this is the conceptual overview I, that I hope is helpful to see. Uh, so I wanted to start by talking about uh, the largest exercise intervention that was done in older adults, which we conducted at the University of Florida in conjunction with eight other sites around the country called the LIFE study. And in that study, um, participants were randomly assigned to either a comprehensive exercise intervention, which consisted of uh, walking for 15 minutes, followed by um, some resistance exercise, lower body resistance training, followed by another 15 minutes of walking, followed by some mobility exercises, okay, in one condition. And they did that, uh, they were instructed to do it uh, three times a week uh, for two years versus uh, an educational intervention. And then we looked at a number of outcomes, but to start with, I want to just focus on the inflammation outcome. And so what we see is this, the successful aging group was the educational group. And you can see what happened over the first six months was their uh, levels of IL-6 went up, whereas in the uh, um, ed exercise intervention condition, the levels basically stayed the same. If anything, they went down slightly by one year, whereas the levels in the successful aging education intervention were uh, up. And so there was a statistically significant difference. Now, you can look at that and say, well, okay, that's great, but it didn't really reduce levels of inflammation. So I would argue that you're right. It didn't reduce, but it prevented the potential increase in levels of inflammation that we would s potentially see in this uh, population of older adults. Now, more exciting, uh, in my opinion, was that when you looked at the development of major mobility disability, which was, again, defined as inability to walk uh, a quarter of a mile or a block. Um, the participants in the physical activity intervention had a significantly lower incident of development of major mobility disability compared to the health education uh, group. And that's, that was true for persistent mobility disability. So, and that meant that on two, two occasions, uh, that this, that individual was unable to walk a block uh, on two visits to our center. And so when you think about the potential of this intervention to prevent or slow the development of disability, in my mind, this is a major finding suggesting the power of a comprehensive exercise program to, to again, res maintain function for a longer period of time. Okay. Um, then, we, one would, uh, may ask, well, what happens if you combined a diet with an exercise program and look to see would that impact uh, markers of inflammation? And so in this study, uh, which was uh, a weight loss intervention that combined um, an education group, an exercise only group, a diet only group, or a diet plus exercise group, you can see the pre pretty large uh, sample size here, and looked at what happened over the course of a year in this marker of inflammation, IL-6, what do we see? Well, we see that in the uh, controlled education group, again, we see a slight increase over time in this marker. In the exercise-only condition, we see a s small decrease over time. In the diet plus uh, exercise condition, we see a reduction, a significant reduction, but actually the most significant reduction was in the diet-only condition, suggesting that the power of diet to really alter uh, this marker of systemic inflammation I is, the, is the driver, that diet was the major driver here, okay? Now, 
I see that generated a lot of discussion. <laughs> um, just to further discuss the potential role of diet, I wanted to uh, show a couple studies that I was involved in. Um, and this was at the Pennington Biomedical Research Center. We looked at the effects of uh, calorie restriction on damage to DNA, so at the cellular level, what's happening. And for a six-month period of time, overweight but healthy individuals were randomly assigned to a, a control American Heart Association diet, a calorie res restriction diet, 25% of their baseline um, intake, a calorie restriction plus physical activity condition, or a low-calorie diet where they ate uh, um, 890 calories until they lost about 15% of their body weight, and then they were maintained on that uh, level for the remaining of, remainder of the study. And what do we see? We see in all three of the calorie-restricted conditions significant reductions in the um, marker of DNA fragmentation, suggesting that um, there is a true effect at the cellular level of um, this intervention. Now, the next question might be, well, what happens if you induce um, energy deficits through exercise? Maybe that wasn't your next question, but that was our question. <laughs> that was our question. And so I um, had the opportunity to look at the effects on changes in RNA and DNA um, oxidized bases through collaboration with some colleagues at our uh, University of Florida over the course of a year in individuals who had a 20% reduction in either their um, energy intake or a 20% increase in their energy expenditure through exercise. And what do we see was fascinating to me that on the bottom you see following 12 months of calorie restriction, this oxidized DNA was decreased. But what happened after 12 months of exercise, increased energy expenditure through e exercise, the damage to the oxidized DNA was also reduced, okay? Similar when you look at oxidized RNA, you can see there's low, lower levels of oxidized RNA in the group that uh, calorie restricted for 12 months, and similar results, similar pattern of results in the group that engaged in exercise <coughs> for 12 months. So what that suggests is that the energy deficits are, are a major driver here that you can induce similar effects through either um, exercising and not increasing your calorie intake or through reducing your calorie intake. Um, so it's, there's more options out there. Now, what you may be saying, well, I don't like either of those. Uh, <laughs> 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 I understand. Um, and so let's talk about that a little bit more. So we know that... Um, First, just a brief summary, we know unhealthy lifestyle factors are associated with increased oxidant stress and potentially can accelerate the aging process. We also know that calorie restriction may be beneficial in reducing reactive oxygen species production during postprandial states and also over time. However, compliance with calorie restriction programs over the long term, we also know, remains poor. So we need new approaches to help normal and overweight individuals derive many of the health benefits associated with calorie restriction. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those. And I think that there's a few promising approaches out there. There's dietary programs that do not involve calorie restriction that may provide similar benefits as calorie restriction. There's a, a phenomenon called intermittent fasting, which uh, I've gotten more and more interested in. And this is essentially an eating pattern in which you consume no or few calories for a predefined period of time uh, that can occur on a, a recurring basis, and it can be from uh, 12 hours to several days in which an individual may not consume food. Now, those are not what we what we looked at, and I'll show you shortly, is uh, a pattern in which people time restrict uh, their eating pattern each day. Okay, so they may only eat for six to eight hours during that day, versus. Um, another pattern of intermittent fasting called alter alternate day fasting, which is what it sounds like, where one day you would eat uh, as you'd like, and the next day you would fast. So alternate eating and fasting days. And then another approach that I think holds promise is something called uh, CR, calorie restriction memetics, which are compounds that can mimic many of the effects of calorie restriction without requiring a reduction in food intake. Okay, now everybody seems a little happier. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay, and so these were, these were the questions that I, we asked in three recent reviews. The, just to briefly reiterate, the first review that I'm going to describe is focused on the question, what is the best diet for weight loss? The second review, uh, the question was, what effect does intermittent fasting have on changes in body composition? And the third review is, what effects do specific nutritional and pharmaceutical compounds have on chronic inflammation levels? So without further ado, uh, so this is the first review, which was just published this year. Uh, if anybody's interested in the article, here it is, um, and we can get you access to this reference. Um, and as you can see, the title, Effects of Popular Diets Without Specific Calorie Targets on Weight Loss Outcomes, and a review of findings from clinical trials. So the goal of this review was to look at evidence um, from current popular diets, as described in the 2016 US News and World Report on short-term uh, and long-term weight loss outcomes. And so short-term was defined as six months long-term as one year okay, in overweight and obese adults. Uh, the diets were selected um, based on, starting with the U.S. News Rep World Report, and then we identified 20 that met our predefined criteria, which meant that they didn't involve specific calorie restriction or specific foods only that they could, uh, in, in the sense that they had to consume meal replacements, okay? So these diets that met our criteria had a, a specific recommendation for foods to eat, but they didn't provide the foods, and they didn't um, insist that calorie restriction occur, okay? So th we then went and looked to see what evidence was out there for these 20 diets, and we I actually only identified uh, a total of 16 articles for seven of the diets that were listed on the 2016 U.S. News and World Report, and the seven diets that had at least um, evidence from at least one clinical trial were the Atkins diet, the DASH diet, this stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension, the Glycemic Index diet, the Mediterranean diet, the Ornish diet, the Paleolithic diet, and the Zone diet. And what we found was, uh, just skip to the key findings here, um, was what you can see at, at six months, when you look at these uh, seven diets, what do we see? We see there's some evidence for the zone diet, but not too much. Some for the vegan, but only one study. One study for the paleolithic diet, which showed pretty nice weight loss of approximately 12 kilograms. The Ornish study, uh, diet had two studies, but they were not, did not produce significant weight loss. The Mediterranean diet at six months did not show significant weight loss either. Um, the glycemic index did not show significant weight loss. The DASH did not show significant weight loss. And then we come to the Atkins diet, which I think the results speak for themselves. When you look at the number of trials that show supportive evidence for this diet, and going into this review, I would, have, would not have predicted this, but, but this was what, what we found. So at six months, you can see a consistent uh, finding of, of weight loss following this, this diet. Okay? And then we looked at long-term weight change, and we see a very similar pattern. So I won't go through each of these. Just to mention the Paleolithic diet did show, again, a nice long-term one-year weight loss effect, but there was only one study. The Mediterranean had two studies, with one of them showing a nice long-term weight loss. And then again, we come to the Atkins diet, where you see a number of st studies that uh, showed consistent long-term um, positive uh, effects for, for weight loss. That was um, an interesting finding. Now, what you might say is, well, is that really um, suggest that I should just go follow the Atkins diet. Well, the next slide may kind of uh, put a little bit of a, soften those findings a little bit, um, qualify those findings. And in this study, which was published in the journal JAMA, which is a very good uh, journal, if not one of the top journals, uh, what we, s and this was not a study I was involved in, but I thought it was important to show, because it gets to the point that we were making earlier, this study looked at these four, four popular diets and looked at um, what effects they had on weight loss outcomes. And, and the key point I want to show in this slide is uh, 
for all four of these diets, what we see is a significant decrease in dietary adherence over the course of a year. <laughs> so, so that's to qualify the finding that I showed you earlier. Those findings uh, may make it seem as though this, there's a perfect diet, and maybe for many people it does work, but also for many people there is a, this progressive reduction in following the diet, regardless of which one it was. Okay, so. All right, so that led me to then say, suggest to myself that, well, maybe there's another option, which is uh, the potential of intermittent fasting and whether that could lead to positive changes in body composition. Could that also induce reductions in uh, cellular oxidative stress and, and chronic inflammation? And so we wrote this uh, review article, which was just published, literally, uh, in the uh, month of February. So um, if anybody's more inter interested, we'll be happy to provide that reference, too. Um, and again, why consider this option? Because we know that current dietary approaches are only modestly effective. Uh, and this may be used as a part of a range of dietary approaches uh, that can be offered to individuals who desire to lose body weight and particularly body fat. Um, I made this point uh, in Ocala, and I kind of want to make it here off the bat, which is that the best approach for any given individual is the one that they will adhere to over time. Okay. Okay, so having said that, um, there are a number of benefits of intermittent fasting on, on your physiology. And this slide can just detail some of the key benefits. At the brain level, you can see neurotropic factor production, synaptic plasticity, mitochondrial biogenesis. At the blood level, there's an elevation in ketone levels. There's uh, elevation in adiponectin levels, which is a a hormone that increases the rate of fat oxidation in the body. Um, I, w I won't read every one of these, but you can just see the systems, the cardiovascular system, the benefits, the adipose tissue benefits. At the muscle level, there's an increase in insulin sensitivity and a reduction in inflammation. Okay. Um, so these are some of the reasons why we were interested in it. Just to show you uh, what it might look like and how this would contrast to a typical eating pattern, for most individuals, a standard eating pattern, you never um, flip what's called this metabolic switch where you all start to utilize ketones as a source of energy, okay? So most people, they eat many times throughout the day, and so they have these glucose ex excursions that occur frequently throughout the day, and they never get to the point where they actually use ketones for energy, so that's the typical. This is an example of the switch being flipped uh, several days each week where uh, an individual may go a long period of time without, without eating. And so you could see if they do not eat from 12 a.m. till approximately um, you know, 8, uh, 8 a.m. the next day, what you can see is the ketone levels are progressively increased in that same individual. Then when they eat, the energy source shifts to, to glucose and the ketone levels drop, okay? In this slide, or in this next uh, figure, what you can see is for an individual who fasted for 18 hours um, every day, what would happen where they would only eat during a, a six hour period, you can see their ketones are elevated until they eat, and then they go again for 18 hours, and then they start to become, again, elevated, and then drop when they, they can eat, and so then the glucose is a source of energy that takes over. So that's just to help you understand a little bit of how this uh, metabolic switch would operate uh, over time. Okay. Why do we want to even do this? <laughs> um, well, fasting and exercise have many similar benefits, and this was a slide that my colleague Mark Matson had put together in his recent review, and I won't read every single benefit, but what you can see is how they converge, fasting and exercise. And at the cellular level, they can increase cellular stress resistance, which is always a good thing. Compar converse that with eating, resting, and sleeping, which are very important, but they have different metabolic and cellular effects, okay? And that's when the cell growth and plasticity occurs. Um, and so, so it's important to have both the um, both processes that occurring in, in the body. You need both to, to optimize function here. Okay. Uh, so back to the review. 
the, the question was, um, what effects do these two different types of intermittent fasting regimens have on body composition? And again, the time-restricted feeding is where the individual um, will eat, eat for less than 12 hours, and generally speaking, it's six to eight hours, and the fasting will occur for 16 to 18 hours. And the alternate day fasting is every other day uh, fasting. And here is the summary of the findings of this review. Um, in the top portion of this uh, figure, what you can see is for the studies that involve time-restricted feeding, three of the four trials showed significant fat loss. And none of the trials was there a significant loss of lean tissue. Okay, so that was pretty interesting. Uh, and then in the bottom portion, 10 out of 10 trials sh that used alternate day fasting showed significant fat loss. Okay, so it's all, all showed significant fat loss. So it wasn't a question of whether this form of intermittent fasting works for fat loss. It does. Um, but I want to provide the caveat that there was this one, that in nine of the 10 trials on the day in which they were fasting, they, all, they had a small amount to eat. So it wasn't a true fast. There was one study in which there was a true fast, in, in which they, the participants fasted the entire day. And that was this study. And what do we see in this case? We see actually a, a greater uh, loss of lean tissue than we see in any of the other studies. So that was an interesting observation. It's not to say that uh, that would occur in every study, and it'd be nice if we had more studies that actually involved true fasting, whereas most studies involved uh, um, modified fasting. Okay, so I'm gonna move forward because I, I know that I'm running short on time here. And just to kind of highlight our most recent review, which was to look at the evidence for nutritional and pharmaceutical interventions that can reduce chronic low-grade inflammation based on clinical trials, okay? And we, did, we conducted a meta-analysis over the course of the past year uh, to look at the effects of various potential interventions uh, that were selected for safety, um, innovation, me me mechanisms, and their practicality or affordability. Um, and just to kind of highlight that again here, once we identified the compounds, we then applied one more criteria, which was that they had to have sufficient evidence from at least three randomized controlled trials. And of the various potential compounds out there, w we identified six that met all of our criteria. And you can see these six right here. Um, and then we, with these uh, compounds, we looked to see what studies actually enrolled participants who were 45 years or old, older and had chronic low-grade inflammation, which was defined as IL-6 greater than 2.5 or C-reactive protein greater than 2.0. And then we, here's sh just our, our flow chart to show you the reason we excluded studies and the number of studies per compound were here. And then the key findings are next. And so when we look at um, which compounds were effective in decreasing IL-6, we see that angiotensin receptor blockers, omega-3, and probiotics all had significant effects in reducing this important inflammatory cytokine. And then when you look at C-reactive protein, we see that these same three plus metformin was effective in reducing uh, levels of C-reactive protein when you summarize those trials. Incidentally, there was no trial with metformin on IL-6, so that's why it wasn't included. So in conclusions, um, interventions that utilize ARBs, omega-3 fatty acids, and probiotics produce significant reductions in both IL-6 and C-reactive protein levels. Metformin, significant reduction in C-reactive protein, so these results provide uh, support for the potential of some nutritional and pharmaceutical compounds to, to significantly reduce established markers of inflammation. Uh, future studies are needed to see if they could actually reduce declines in function, because that would be the next step. And then the overall summary that I want to kind of impart are four key points. 
And that's first, that chronic inflammation, we know, contributes to a host of age-related disease conditions, disability, and mortality. It's bad. Uh, <laughs> Lifestyle represents a modifiable risk factor. There's a number of non-modifiable risk factors, but lifestyle is one that is modifiable. Um, we also know from over three or four decades of research now, most individuals do not adhere to calorie restriction or specific dietary programs over the long term, but approaches that combine sustainable lifestyle change with empirically supported nutritional compounds may have promise in reducing inflammation Aging, which is <laughs> a term. Thank you very much for your attention. She's for, she was the first thing I saw. How does this intermittent fasting, how do you deal with that if you're hypoglycemic? or if you're diabetic? Good question. Um, I think that you want to first consult, uh, always consult with your physician, primary care physician, before engaging in any lifestyle change. Um, it, it's likely going to be individually specific. If, if you are hypoglycemic, it may not be the best approach uh, for somebody who's hypoglycemic because of the potential to lower glucose even further. For most individuals, the, the, the issue is the opposite, hy hyperglycemia, and so with aging, and so th that's why it has the potential for, for that group. But that's a good question. Uh, Surgery seems to take care of certain things, and uh, I didn't see where liposuction or any kind of like fat removal out of your system may make a change. And then last, uh, a complement of that question is, uh, you briefly talked about uh, fatty acids and omega uh, omega-3s. Does that actually help a lot? So, um, sure. So with the surgery question, um, I don't know the literature in that area is that well. I would think there is the potential to, if you are able to remove the fat, to have beneficial effects, uh, metabolically speaking, because of all the reasons I talked about. Um, the omega-3 question is a little easier for me to answer and, and to say that the evidence from our review suggests that it does indeed lower uh, levels of IL-6 and CRP in, in the blood. We're currently uh, engaged in what's called the Energize trial, which is a multi-site intervention looking at the effects of omega-3 in older adults with elevated levels of inflammation um, to see does it do what I just said. Does it reduce inflammation and lead to improvements in mobility and physical function? The results should be uh, out within uh, the next six months. So, so I hope to have more of an answer for the omega-3 question, but I certainly believe in its promise. Uh, I see him. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about the fact that uh, you talk specifically about calorie reduction as, and, and, and just because you lose weight, and I'm, I'm, I'm really dis disappointed to see the Atkins diet up there because losing weight uh, doesn't necessarily mean you're healing your body. And there was a lot of emphasis on the Atkins, but an Atkins diet can really rip your body apart badly. And I just wondered, I, I, I didn't hear too much in the way of nutritional uh, emphasis and, 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 and a diet or a lifestyle is a lifestyle change. It's not a diet. And that's why, I mean, if you change your lifestyle of eating, that, that way you don't have to quit your diet. Uh, so, um, so I'm confused as a question. Uh, well, it wasn't a question. It was a comment <laughs> as much as anything. <laughs> but my, my, but basic, my basic thing is, is I didn't see much emphasis on nutrition um, because well, maybe it's not within the scope of what you were trying sure, to say. Sure, sure. And uh, let me say, I think your point about uh, the, the Atkins is a, is a good one that it has, I, I didn't say that it, it could have the potential to have detrimental consequences if, if followed in a certain way. The, the goal was really just to show you the, the findings from clinical trials and to show what effects individuals in those trials had in, in terms of their weight loss outcomes. Um, the, the idea of specific nutrition to follow within that program, 
could be a talk in, in all of it itself because there, there's so many factors for us to think about. Um, so I do appreciate your point there. there. Time for one more question. Oh, okay. Um, he was first. Uh, could you define ARBs again? Sure. Uh, angiotensin receptor blockers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I, 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 was it, that your, not your qu question? Yeah, that was it. But any um, easier explanation for what it is? Okay. and it, uh, That's a good question. Uh, so they're, they're compounds that work on the re renin angiotensin system. And in terms of dilating blood vessels, is my understanding of how they can uh, lower blood pressure and have a beneficial effect. Um, Losartan would be one example of, of a medication that's an angiotensin receptor blocker. And, and that's what we're testing uh, in the trial. Let's thank our speaker. <laughs>